Take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, starting in the 16th verse of Luke chapter 4. We'll read down to the 32nd verse. Starting in verse 16, And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all of them were in the synagogue, were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land, but unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto the Sarapata, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elias, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the, Sir, the Syrian. And all in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and led him unto the brow of the hill, whereon, whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way, and came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath day. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this opportunity. I know it's Wednesday. Our flesh is weary. We're tired, Lord. But I pray that you'll give us strength for this time, for this hour, to dive into your word and be fed from your word. We pray that you'll be with those who are teaching next door, Lord. I pray for all the preachers who are in your local New Testament church, lifting up your name and preaching the hope of this world, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you'll strengthen them. Souls will be saved tonight that will be sharpened by your word this evening. We give thanks to you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, we was looking through the Gospels and really gleaning on what it really means to stick with Jesus. And that's what the Gospels is really pointing on to us, is that it's good to stick with Jesus. There's no better decision than to stick with Jesus. But even more, verse 32 here says, and they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. And this brings us to another thought process about sticking with Jesus. Is that it's more than just following him. It's about tuning our lives to being like him. 
Uh, we even lifted up prayer requests before the services is that, that, that we would have boldness to preach the gospel, that we would have the strength to uh, preach the gospel to this lost and dying world. But when we say we want to preach the gospel with power, what we're really saying is it's not that we're desiring for an inflection in our voice. We're desiring for the Holy Spirit to arrive and preach with us, to make this message true in our lives. So here in this part of Luke chapter 4, the gospel draws our eyes to a desire to be more like Jesus when it comes to evangelism. To be more like Jesus when it comes to deliver this truth. Here in Luke chapter 4, we're kind of brought to a place where the Lord has delivered a gospel. He's delivered it again. People reject him, and yet we find this fatality, really, that it plagues all of us, our own pride. So as we move forward in being more like Jesus, our eyes are again are drawn to this text. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. The Lord had arrived here in Nazareth and began to deliver the word of God to them, which we see in verses 18 and 19. There was a story that was once told about this wealthy couple. Their, ch their child had this rare, life-threatening disease. And as the child had this rare, life-threatening disease, they had searched far and wide trying to find help, aid, treatment for their son. In the process of trying to find this treatment and help for their son, they came to find out that the only one that could help their son was a doctor who lived overseas. Well, they wasn't going to be prohibited by this, so they quickly put the pen to the pad and began to write a letter to the doctor overseas and explain to them how desperately their son needed help. The doctor responded to the letter. He even felt sorry for them, but he responded to the letter and explained to them that he was too busy, even in his own practice, to find time to come to the United States and help them. So some time had passed. They were disappointed in receiving this news, but before long, the doctor had found himself in a situation where he had become ill. So the doctor's doctor said, listen, you're overwhelmed with stress. What you need to do is find yourself a place to get away and take a journey and find a time to regroup. Well, the doctor had remembered about the letter that was written to him from this place in America. So he decided to take a trip to America and vacation there. So he arrives there and he begins this recuperation process in this town with no desire to search this family out to try to treat the kid. One of the things his doctor had told him is, you need to get out and just enjoy the countryside. Just get out and enjoy the air. Well, one day that he goes for this walk, it's kind of gloomy outside and in fear that it might rain, he tells his driver, listen, I'm going to go for a walk, but keep your eyes outside and if it begins to rain, come fetch me. So he finds himself a couple miles away from this place, this estate in which he had rented, and it begins to pour down rain. So he sought shelter underneath the porch of this other estate. The lady, this wealthy lady looking out the window, seeing this man standing on her porch, sent her butler to the porch to tell the man to get off her porch or she was going to call the authorities on him. So he listened to the lady and went out and stood in the rain and soon his butler fetched him, but he was so disappointed so irritated with the way he had been treated when he was just trying to find cover from the rain that he packed his bags and headed back overseas. The next morning, while this lady was reading the newspaper article, she screamed loud at the dinner table. 
And when she had screamed so loud, it had actually frightened her husband. She was unable to get her composure for some time. And finally, when she got her composure, she told her husband the tragic news. The man in the newspaper, the man who was able to treat her son with this rare disease, she kicked him off the porch last evening. The doctor who could have helped her, she was the one that shooed him away. That's exactly the thought process of what has happened here in Luke chapter 4. The doctor has arrived on the scene. The great physician is here. He can help the children of Nazareth. He can help all of these people. And yet, while Jesus is standing in front of them on the doorsteps, they're shooing him away. They're rejecting his message. They're rejecting him help, his help. They're shamefully treating him. I mean, look what he says unto them. In verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. This is great news. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives in recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them are, that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he goes on to tell them in verse 21, and he began to say unto them, this day is, the, is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now, that's this, this time of healing is now. He is professing that this is a prophetic moment of the Old Testament being fulfilled in the New Testament. I mean, this should be an exciting time. They've already been marveled, marveling and amazed by these great miracles that the Lord has done. I mean, think about it. Of all the people who gathered in the synagogue and they sat down to hear Jesus read the scriptures and teach him and teach the scriptures. Yet, we are again turned to the fact in the end of verse 22, and they said, is this not Joseph's son? That was the question at hand. They refused to turn. They refused to seek the liberty. They refused to have their broken hearts healed. They remained broken because they refused to see Jesus for who he is. This is the tragic news for many of our family members. This is the tragic news for many people that we have preached the gospel to. They will be broken, bitter, devastated by their sins, consuming them, so swallowing them up in every moment. Yet, when they are presented with Jesus, the great physician, the healer, they reject him. They sue him off the porch, yet he's being presented to them that he can bring them hope. And these people of Nazareth are doing the same thing to the Lord that many do today. They fail to experience what it means to be free from the burdens of sin free from the captives of this life, free from the things that entangle us. You see, even more, there was a point in the text in the first part of verse 22. Look at this. It's almost hard to understand that both of these statements are in one verse. And all that bear, witness, bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. They were amazed by it. They were wondered by it. They, they marveled at the words which came out of the mouth of the Lord. And yet after they reasoned it out in their own carnal minds, they came to the conclusion, is this not Joseph's son? To which the Lord would respond, listen, you are no different than your forefathers. I mean, really, that's what verses 23 through 27 shows us. You're no different than all those who came before you. He said there were other widows in Israel during the days of Elijah. There was other widows there. 
when there was a famine for a time of three years or six months? Do you think that she was the only widow in all of Israel who could use some food, but yet only one was fed from Elijah? He said, even in the days of, a, of Elisha, even in his days, there were many lepers in Israel. But even though there were many lepers in Israel, in the time of Elisha, there was only one who sought Elisha out, seeing Elisha for who he was, trusted the Lord that God was going to use Elisha to heal him. And only one named Naaman of Syria, the Naaman the Syrian was healed. And so the Lord puts before them, you are blinded just like your forefathers. You have failed to see help from God when it's right on your doorstep. You have failed to see the power of God right when it's at your doorstep. You are blinded by what? They're blinded by their own pride. This is the danger of why so many today fail to see the gospel for what it is. They fail to see Christ. It is because of their own pride. I, many times in my own personal life, had developed theories about how I was going to reform myself and change my own ways. You know what? I did good for three months, and then I was right back to my old shenanigans. I didn't need a reformation. I need a transformation. And that is what the gospel brings to us. It makes us new creatures in Christ. But what keeps us away from and this transformation is that we believe that we can change ourselves. The Lord says, you guys have this great opportunity for liberty, sight given back to the blind, literally delivered from bondage. You guys have this great opportunity right here. This scripture, I, it's, almost, it's almost tragic when you really read it, that the Lord says that all of this is given to them. Listen. And the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal. By the way, don't miss that. To preach the gospel to the poor. Listen, when you're poor, it's hard to hear good news. When you're poor, it's hard to think. It's hard to even try to understand what kind of good news you have in your life. But this text says God has sent his son Jesus here in this moment to be fulfilled, to take great news to those who have nothing at all. Even more, he sent me to heal the brokenhearted to preach the deliverance to the captives, recovering sight of the blind, to set liberty at them are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, when you're like, this is great, but when you get to verse 21, it says, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Ah, it should be fulfilled in their hearts. But it only made it to their ears. It wasn't real in their hearts. So they remained in their way. It wasn't real in their lives. So it remained in their ears. Now, I suppose we must ask ourselves, when we take on evangelism, what do we do with hostile encounters? What do we do? You know, we said last week we could understand what it means to stick with Jesus, to walk with Jesus, but now we need to learn how to preach like Jesus. And when you learn to preach like Jesus and you want to preach with the boldness of Jesus, you need to understand how we're going to handle hostile encounters. Verse 29 says, and they rose up, or actually go to verse 28, and all that, on all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him unto the brow of the hill, whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. I mean, they just loved him. Matter of fact, they said, go to the front of the synagogue and read something to us. Matter of fact, go to the front of the synagogue and explain to us that which you're going to prepare and read to us. But when he delivered unto them this truth, and when he delivered this truth with further explanation that this was the moment that Isaiah was speaking of, they 
wondered and said, are you not this Joseph's son? And even further, he gave them even more scriptures. And this truth, realize this. You would say, well, uh, there's all kinds of debates about whether you should, when you're witnessing to somebody, do you go straight to the gospel message? Do you take a person to the law? Do you first find someone and show someone that they're condemned and then go forward to the gospel and this, this, that, and the other? Listen, people at times get so caught up in technique that they fail to understand truth has to be presented. The gospel is good news to the lost and dying soul who recognizes they got a lost and dying soul. But to ever think that you could present a true gospel message and it not be offensive, you're wrong. It's offensive because it removes your pride. It removes what you believe that you can do. They marveled at him and then they wanted to kill him. As soon as the Lord made it clear that to them also that they, you know, they were missing the whole deal. They were missing this healing. They were just as those in the days of the prophets. How do we handle it when someone is nasty to us about the Lord? Do we have a return strategy? We don't see it here, but if you kind of find the follow the gospels along, you know, it all plots out into a perfect course. This Mark chapter six and verse one covers the Lord's earthly ministry a year from this moment in time. In a year from this moment in time in Luke chapter 4, you know what we find Jesus doing in Mark 6, 1? Returning to Nazareth to preach the gospel again. He didn't return back to Nazareth to go and slip into his family's house and have dinner and slip back out before the crowd recognizes him. Mark chapter 6 and verse 1 takes us right back to the synagogue. Jesus went right back into the synagogue. He went right back to opening the word of God, right back to preaching the gospel message. This was the Lord's strategy. Well, hold on now. Some people would say, you're crazy. This is the thought process of ourselves today. I mean, we've, I've heard this said many times. I'm sure we all had. Oh, you can't go there, brother. It's hostile. You can't go there, brother. I mean, remember the last time you were there, this happened. You know, that happened. It almost costed you this. The strategy of the Lord's earthly ministry was that he continued to take the Costco to places that were hostile towards him because that was his call. So what does this mean for us? Mark 6, 1, in connection with Luke chapter 4. Preaching the gospel to, let's go to close encounters because they're the, they're, they're the most real to us. You know, how many of us at times have preached the gospel to our own family members and it turned hostile? And what we do is for the next encounter at the next family event that happens once a year, we say, you know what? They've heard the gospel. They know the gospel. Therefore, I don't need to preach the gospel. And we took an act that we did five years ago into the five-year plan of why I haven't continued to preach the gospel to her. That's not the Lord's earthly ministry plan. When the Lord seen the people from Nazareth again, we went straight back to the word of God straight back to preaching the word of God, straight back to teaching the word of God. Now, I do think that we should be strategic in how we conduct ourselves. I mean, don't walk in your uh, family's front door and just open your Bible and start preaching the gospel to everybody and saying, my pastor told me to do this. I'm saying we have to strategize and not find ourselves at a place of complacency so that we fail to realize a year from now when we have another family encounter, we should still be seeking the opportunity, even if it was hostile the last time, to preach the word of God. Hostility shouldn't shut up the truth. Hostility, matter of fact, if you think they're hostile towards you now, let them get a hold of you if it was even possible after 25 minutes in hell. You want to talk about somebody being hostile towards you. 
so this is our situation here. Jesus did not return and hide and spend time with his family at dinner. He returned to the synagogue and Mark chapter 6 and verse 2 said that he began to preach the word of God. From the human point of view, many would say this is foolish, forgetful, potentially faithful. But for the Lord, this was his calling. The Lord's return was a wonderful expression of mercy. It was a wonderful expression of steadfast love. It was a wonderful act of caring. You see, where some would say, I'm not going to return to my family with the gospel because it's going to be a hostile situation, returning with the gospel shows that you truly care. It shows that you truly love them. It shows that you truly believe hell is real. It shows them that you truly believe that heaven's real. And that is the place that's in store for those who place their faith in Jesus Christ. So why would we not be repetitive? I mean, none of us would ever see a child walk up to the stove and say, don't do it. And then just let them keep going. No, we start shouting, hey, and doing anything we can to stop them from going there. And so it is real with the gospel. This is the position that we are in. I also love that even in this with Luke 4 and Mark chapter 6, that the Lord returns back to them, to the same people who were hostile towards them and begins to preach the word of God to the hard-hearted people. Don't forget this. He was gracious and he was patient with the hard-hearted people. He was patient. He wasn't belligerent. He wasn't saying you're going to die or burn any. No, he was patient. He continues to be patient with the foolish. He continues to be patient with the doubting. He continues to be patient with the rebellious sinners like you and me. If God wasn't patient, I wouldn't be here preaching tonight. If God wasn't patient, you wouldn't be here listening to me preach tonight. The fact is that God is patient. Matter of fact, if we would just get a hold of the fact that God is patient, it may solve a lot of our eschatological issues. It might fix our eschatology, so to say, our end-time view. See, we often take our end-time view in view of ourselves. We say, Lord, get me out of this place. I'm tired of hurting. I'm tired of struggling. I'm tired of the people that I work with. I'm tired of this. That, when we view our eschatology from ourselves, it's self-centered. We want him to come now. When we view our eschatology from God's point of view, we understand why God is not here yet because he's patient. And because where we're ready to get out of this wicked place, the Lord is still desiring that the wicked will be saved. The Lord is still waiting for this moment for souls to be saved. You want your eschatology to hurry up? Preach God's word. I'm a firm believer when the last soul is saved that's on the roster, I'm out of here. So this is the place that we're called to. I'm thankful that the Lord is patient. There was an excerpt one commentator had commented on about this section of Luke chapter 4, it was about a comic strip about Dennis the Menace. It says Dennis the Menace was one day leaving Mr. Wilson's house, and him and his buddy Joey was carrying candy. It said Joey looked over and asked Dennis, Dennis, do you think we deserve this candy? Dennis laughed and answered with this packed truth. He said, look, Joey, Miss Wilson gives us these here cookies and candy, not because we're nice, but because she's nice. This is our blessed reality in Christ. We are beneficiaries of divine favor, not because we are so good, but because God is so good. When we studied through James chapter 1 and verse 17, he said, Every good and perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. He is good. He's patient. He is merciful with us and even with the wicked. 
So the Lord returns to Nazareth. He's patient with the people here in Nazareth. Though we have no record that he returned after this, it also kind of brings us to this light that God is the God of first chances when he was there the first time, and the Lord is, uh, God is the God of second chances, but there's also that the reality that God is the God of final chances. Now, don't let this disturb your doctrine on God's sovereignty. I'm not speaking of that at all. I'm speaking of our human responsibility. That the Lord preached the word of God to them even though they weren't saved the first time, yet he preached it again to them the second time. And so it is even of our own responsibility that we cannot sit back and say, the Lord is sovereign, therefore I will not preach. No, there is this responsibility that he gives us the first chance. He gives us the second chance. Therefore, we must use these chances wisely. God is not only like this with the lost who are in sins, but he likes, he's like this with us who are all here today. First, or Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, uh, perish but that all should come to repentance. And the, the Paul said, what did he say? Today is the day of salvation. And now is the time. Today, even for us, the Lord is long-suffering. That today we could confess our sins. That today we would pray, repent. The, the Lord is long-suffering for these things. Even more, we have to ask ourselves, what is really the problem here with the people in Nazareth? What's the problem? Verse 29 again, and and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him unto the brow of the hill whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. They left first in astonishment and ended in anger. What's the deal? It's their own pride. They get this. They can't get past the fact that we grew up with Jesus. Aren't you Joseph's son? We, we grew up with you. Matter of fact, you could even think that some may even reason that Jesus, didn't you build the cabinets in my dining room? He was a carpenter in Nazareth. He built things. He had been among them. He had, they had seen him his entire life and now they have been so welled up with pride that the Lord has delivered this unto them that they can't not get past who he was to see who he is. J. Oswald, J. Oswald, Oswald Sanders wrote, nothing is more distasteful to God than self-conceit. This was Satan's deal and this is many of ours today. Pride is this moment where we desire to enthrone ourselves at God's expense, at God's expense. When pride is in control, it hinders us from working to it hinders Jesus from working to make a difference in our life. Pride hinders faith in an unexplainable work of God. That was the reality among the residents in Jesus' hometown. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished. Mark captures it by Mark captures this by saying, And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this is given unto him that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? They're, they're confused here. Where did this come from? He was Joseph's son, the carpenter. Yet they have come to this conclusion. But the mighty works that we've seen in his hands, these things that he's telling unto us, from whence is this wisdom? Where did he get all of this? How has he arrived at this? So it, it led them to this place where they come to the conclusion, it's either from God 
or it's not. It's either the works are either of God or they're of Satan. The dynamic ministry of Jesus amazed the people, and they wanted to know the source of his wisdom and power. God or not? Is this of Satan or is it not? Divine power was at work through Jesus, or he worked these wonders in some ungodly force. What they thought they knew about Jesus would not allow them to believe the ministry of Jesus was from God. How could it be? He was one of them. How could he be any different? They could not understand him. Therefore, they questioned him. This is a troubling turn in Luke chapter 4. This is a troubling turn in all of our own personal lives, even as believers. Oftentimes, as we serve the Lord, we look at the people here in, in, in Nazareth, we say, wow, you knew him. You knew him your whole life. And now all these amazing miracles are happening. You've experienced and seen all these things. The blind were healed. You can't deny that. The lame were walking. You can't deny that. I mean, look at what he's done. But they could not get past about what they knew of him. They couldn't understand how he had arrived at this situation. Remember, realize this. This is where the problem happens, right? When they could not understand, is he not from Joseph? That is what caused them to question his power and his authority and that he was from God. And even in our own personal lives, we serve the Lord. We believe he saved us. But when we cannot understand the things that are going in our lives, and why things are going the way that they are going, what do we find ourselves doing? At times, we question God. What are you doing? And we find ourselves in the same place as the people of Nazareth. We've walked with God. We've known God. We've experienced his miracles in our life. We've experienced, we've seen God turn people's lives around. And yet when we can't reason what he's doing in our personal lives. It leads us to a place to question <laughs> our Lord and Savior. This is the danger of being like the people of Nazareth. This is the danger of walking with Jesus but missing being like Jesus. So what do we say? Well, we say what Solomon taught. Solomon taught this very text in the Old Testament about questioning the credibility of God. I mean, we quote this verse, we teach it to our kids, even as a young child. It's one of the first verses that we learn, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, right? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. What does that mean? It means you can trust God. And do not ever question his credibility. Just trust. Because when you question God, <laughs> you end up just like these people, missing the things of God. When we question who he is and what he's done in our lives, or when we question the things that we're seeing and experiencing in our life, we miss the glorious things that we can receive at his benefit. What does he say? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. In other words, do not depend on what you think you know. Do not allow yourself to think you know something to be an excuse for trusting God. That's what we do often, right? We think we have the understanding of something. We think we know what we need to do. Therefore, we lack trust in God. Just because you cannot see what God is up to, it does not mean that God is not at work. So our, our takeaway for this evening is what? In order to be like Jesus, in order to evangelize like Jesus, the first thing we must do is to not just do a pass and run. If we approach a hostile group, pray, give it time and return. Look for strategic moments, even through this holiday season. 
We have to, even if our own family has become hostile with us, we have to get them the message that will change their life. They're hostile not with you, but with God's word. That's one. What's the second part of this? Is that when we recognize that um, we have this opportunity to preach God's word, that we seize the moment, but also that recognizing that when we preach the gospel, not everyone is going to get to experience the power of the gospel like they did in the time of Elijah, like they did in the time of Elias, like they did at the time of Jesus, and like they do in our very present day. Yet, it does not eliminate our responsibility to continue to reach people, the same people who were hostile to us for Christ. Also, what we learn here from this message is that even in our own lives, we must never allow things that we do not understand <laughs> while we're with Jesus to cause us to ever bring us to a place where we question him. They didn't understand him. Isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't this Joseph's son? And then they became angry. Then they were even more angry. Then they wanted to throw him out the, over the brow of the hill and kill him. We all have to arrive at this place where Proverbs says, just trust in the Lord. Well, you know, it's going pretty bad. Trust the Lord. We can't question him. If we question him, it all puts us at odds with the truth of God's word. It puts us at odds with the Lord. It, it, it says to us even here what we see here, that when they questioned the Lord, there was nothing else left for them besides judgment. Now, for us who are saved, when we question the Lord, I think it robs us of the joy, it robs us of our excitement, it robs us of the relationship, it robs us from what we have while we serve him. It, surely it must because we're no longer trusting him. So this holiday season, I know it's coming on us, Thanksgiving is just around the corner. Trust the Lord, even with those who have been hostile in our family with the gospel. Trust the Lord, seize opportunities. Realize we may have had the first chance the last time, and we may get the second chance the next time. But there's also a time where it's going to be the last chance. I want to be able to say that I was faithful to that which he had given me to do. Faithful to preaching his word. Faithful to the, I can't save nobody, but I can be faithful to the cause, even to those who are hostile, and just trust the Lord even in the moments where our family is hostile with us, we will not be questioning the Lord about them being hostile. We will trust him that he knows this situation. And if we truly love them, we have to be patient like the Lord was patient and caring and long-suffering with those people. All right, let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we give thanks to you and praise you for all that you've done, Lord. I, I see the challenges on every page, Lord, to be more like you and to evaluate even in my own life what it, what it means to be more like you and the love you had and the mercy you had and the compassion you had and the long-suffering you had and the returning to those who didn't treat you well. Uh, to put your own pride aside to reach fallen humanity, to put your own pride aside and to return to those who was ready to throw you over the hill. Lord, I pray that you'll work in each and every one of our own hearts and realize that there's something greater in this world than my existence. There's something greater in this world than my own pride. And that is this gospel message, Lord. I pray that as these seasons are uh, getting ready to come upon us, Lord, that we seize them and we, in the wisest way and led by the Spirit, seize all opportunities to plant your word. We give thanks to you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen.